Welcome, friends. Grab your favorite cup of tea, coffee, or cocoa, and settle in for Sips from the Sip from the Utica Institute Museum. Sips from the Sip is all about sharing the history of little-known people and places in Mississippi. We're serving up truth, justice, with a dollop of sass. I'm your host, Jean Green. Today's episode is the 21st of a multi-part series of readings and discussions from the book Black Man's Burden. William Henry Holtzclaw was born in 1874 and raised in rural Randolph County, Alabama to sharecropping parents. The Tuskegee graduate founded the Utica Normal and Industrial Institute for the Training of Colored Young Men and Women in Utica, Mississippi in 1903, making it the first little Tuskegee to be established in Mississippi. The Black Man's Burden, the autobiography of William Holtzclaw published in 1915, made him one of the first black men to publish a book in Mississippi. Chapter 11 covers the creation of the Black Belt Improvement Society. Chapter 11. Another way in which we helped the people was through the organization of our Black Belt Improvement Society. Our people are great lovers of society, so much so that a man who does not belong to one is hardly counted. I was not a member of any society until I organized the Black Belt Improvement Society at Utica a society similar to the organization that I had originally established in Snow Hill, Alabama. As soon as the doors were opened, the colored people flocked in until almost everybody in the community had been initiated and had ridden the goat. But this society had a serious purpose, for its object was to help the colored people who were at the very bottom of the pit of mental darkness by showing them how to make a start and build themselves up gradually to the status of property-owning citizens. The following extracts taken from its constitution and bylaws will give some insight as to how it proposed to accomplish its object. There shall be 10 degrees in this society. 1. Members of the first degree shall be those who have and show a desire to better their condition. 2. Members of the second degree shall be regularly employed at some occupation. 3. Members of the third degree shall be required to own at least one cow, one mule, or a horse. 4. Members of the fourth degree shall possess 12 chickens, two pigs, and a cow, together with an orderly house. 5. Members of the fifth degree shall be required to own livestock and to have purchased land and to be striving to pay for it. 6. Members of the sixth degree shall be required to own at least one acre of land and have erected upon it a neat and comfortable dwelling house. 7. Members of the seventh degree shall own 40 acres of land. 8. Members of the eighth degree shall own 100 acres of land. 9. Members of the ninth degree shall own 500 acres of land. 10. Members of the 10th degree shall own 1,000 acres of land and shall possess such other qualifications as the Central Society may require. Any member who is educating a son or daughter in some institution may be permitted to hold the 4th degree regardless of the other qualifications mentioned. No member is in good standing so long as there is a mortgage on any of his substance. The following stenographic report made of Mr. Buck Davis at a recent conference of farmers will shed some light as to the effect that this new organization has had upon the progress of the people in the community. Five years ago, while riding along one evening, I happened to meet Mr. Holtzclaw. He stopped me and asked me what did I owe or whether or not I was in debt. In them times, I did not think it was anybody's business how much I owed. I think Mr. Holtzclaw saw how I felt about it, for he said, The reason I ask you is, I want to show you how to get out of debt. 
as I wanted to get out of debt, I then told him I owed $60.60. I had been working as a share tenant for 30 years and had been making big cotton crops every year most of that time. But it had taken all that I made every year to pay my debts, and still they was not paid. Mr. Hoskaw told me that the Black Belt Improvement Company would show me how to get out. I didn't let them take charge of my affairs. It was not long before I was able to go and hand over to the merchant all the money I owed him. He did not want to take the money at first, said he did not care whether his good customers paid him or not, just so they kept on paying. I stuck to the Black Belt Improvement Company and attended the farmers' conferences, listening to others talk how they got out. So I worked on under the direction of the Black Belt Improvement Company until I am now on foot and have got started. I feel a little above owing a man now. I feel independent. I was in debt 30 years. Now I do not owe any man. I have bought a lot of land on which I have paid $10 and I owe $15 more. Also, I have bought a 10-acre farm plot and have paid $50 on it. I mean to build me a house on the first lot and keep the other for farming. I have dug every nickel I possess out of the ground. I'm a member of the Black Belt Improvement Company and a friend to the Utica Institute. And I know Mr. Hoseclaw has helped me to become what I am. This society has grown rapidly. In recent years, it has been incorporated by the state of Mississippi, and it is no longer called the Black Belt Improvement Society but the Black Belt Improvement Company capitalized at $30,000, and it has in its possession several hundred acres of valuable lands, which it is regularly selling to the colored people in the vicinity of the school in small tracts upon easy payments. As the school is situated five miles from the town and has no magistrate within easy reach, the Black Belt Improvement Company established a community court of justice, wholly independent of the state or local courts. This court attends to all misdemeanors that happen within the Utica Institute colony outside of the school proper. It has grown until it has come to be recognized by all the residents as the tribunal before which they must come if they disobey the established customs of the community. For instance, one day a resident was accused of having stolen some corn from his neighbor's crib. His case was promptly called on a Saturday afternoon during the rest hour, and the whole Utica colony, men, women, and children, turned out. I was in the judge's seat, as they have always honored me with that office. Lawyers were appointed on both sides, and the case was thoroughly thrashed out. I charged the jury, we have but five jurymen, who withdrew and after a while returned a sealed verdict. When it was opened, it read somewhat like this. We, the jury, find according to the evidence that the defendant, when he left the neighbor's crib, did have something under his coat like a sack of corn. But we, the jury, are unable to say that every lump a man has under his coat is of necessity a sack of corn. We, therefore, recommend that the man be discharged with the cost of court and one that hereafter, when he leaves a neighbor's crib, he should carry his coat on his arm so that the world can see he has no corn. The man was dismissed, and so far as I know, no more corn has been reported stolen in the Utica colony. Another case in point was a man who had been reported for whipping his wife. After all the evidence was in and the lawyers had made their arguments, the jury retired and disagreed. I asked the parties to the controversy if they would be willing to abide by the decision of the judge, and while they Promptly agreed to do so, I ordered the man to stand still and let his wife strike him 39 times. This she proceeded to do, and the court adjourned, and no case of wife beating has come under my notice since. These happenings served in the early days to break the monotony and dispel gloom, and at the same time they taught valuable lessons and created a spirit of general progress in the right direction. By these methods, the extension work, the conferences, and the Black Belt Improvement Society, we have 
been enabled to get a firm grip on the people, not only in the immediate vicinity of the school, but throughout the two counties in which we labor, and even further still. In those early days, the community was very different from what it is now. The Negroes were constantly crossing one another's paths, so to speak, so that there were every week somewhere in the neighborhood some quarrels to be adjusted. These misunderstandings between neighbors were usually thrashed out in the courts, very often entailing considerable expense on one or the other of the parties, and sometimes on both. Once we had succeeded in getting all the people of the community to agree to accept the decision of our local court in all these small matters, it was an easy matter to keep them out of the state and county courts, and in this way, to save them a great deal of money, to say nothing of time. In all these years, not one member of the community has failed to keep its pledge to abide by the decision of the local court. At this stage of our work, various newspapers and magazines were beginning to take interest in our efforts, and they endorsed from time to time, either in editorials or in articles, the efforts we were making. Collier's Weekly, at this time published a strong editorial describing the work in detail as its reporter had gleaned the story on our grounds. Soon after this editorial was published, I received a large number of letters from various parts of the country offering assistance, both moral and financial. In this way, our efforts were brought more and more to public notice. During that same year, the Natchez Democrat, a white Democratic paper published at Natchez, Mississippi, published in full the story of its own representative. The story gives a pretty clear idea of the situation at this time and is as follows. Quietly and without the blowing of a trumpet, William H. Holtzclaw of the Utica Normal and Industrial Institute, located at Utica, Mississippi, is doing a remarkable work for the uplift of his people in that community. From an humble beginning, a few years ago, under the shade of an old oak tree, the Utica Normal and Industrial Institute has assumed mammoth proportions. At present, March 1908, it has on its farm of 1,500 acres, 14 buildings, large and small, where more than 400 students are taught the various trades and are given an English education by its faculty of 22 teachers. But the good of the school cannot be measured by buildings and land alone. Its influence upon the people of that community is so remarkable and the possibilities for greater work in the future are so encouraging that the careful observer is compelled to make a mental reservation in favor of the future of the Negro race. Under the example set by school authorities, the men of the community seek to have more comfortable homes for their families. The young men who used to shoot dice within a stone's throw of the little house used for holding monthly church services have taken on a more serious air, are less boisterous, and are at least careful of their morals. As a direct result of the industrial propaganda, they are content to stay on the farms and thus win competence for themselves and their families instead of flocking to the cities. And the Negroes of the community themselves contribute on an average of $1,500 a year to the support of the institution, thus learning the glorious lesson of self-help. The greater part of the funds necessary to maintain the institution annually come from the North, but the white people of the immediate community lend their financial aid and moral support to an astonishing degree. This statement is verified by the names of Bishop Charles B. Galloway, Mr. W. J. Ferguson, President of the Bank of Utica, and other leading Mississippi white men. This work is destined to be a factor in the development of the Negro in this state, and by his work and from his public speeches, William H. Holtzclaw proves that in matters affecting his race, he will make a leader safe and sane. Thank you for tuning in to Sips from the Sip. 
Joining me next time to discuss Chapter 11 will be Dr. Shirley Hopkins Davis. Dr. Davis, who is Dean Emeritus of Hines Community College Utica Campus, will continue the discussion we began with Chapter 10. Be sure to tune in for what I'm sure will be a very lively discussion. The Utica Institute Museum is dedicated to expanding knowledge of the history of Utica Institute and its role in Southern Black education. This program is supported by donations from our listeners. If you enjoy learning about the history of William Holtz called the Utica Institute and Mississippi, consider donating. To support Sips from the Sip and all the work at the Utica Institute Museum, visit our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Utica Institute. Until next time, this has been Jean Green coming to you from the heart of the Sip.